Well, folks, uh, before I bring your next speaker, I want to tell you something. Um, this just conference, a great tool, as I said last night, for me to find speakers, were the Southern Poverty Law Center's intelligence report. And they came out, and in this issue, and they said, you know, Congressman Ron Paul is a supporter of these people, you know. And Bob Schultz and Joe Bannister, Sheriff Richard Mack, Alex Jones, Gary Franchi, Ted Gunnarsson. So many of our friends and our past speakers at this conference were here. And I thought, well, I guess that's a good indication where some of our future speakers should come from. So I consulted this as far as getting future speakers. And then uh, I noticed this, and the center of the whole thing, I noticed this uh, smiling picture of this pretty young lady. I thought, wow, you get these young women doing all this freedom works, you know, uh, out there, you know, in Texas. Oh, wow, wait a minute, I don't see that many young people doing this kind of stuff. So I said, we gotta look into this. And this young lady, who I'm gonna bring for you next, has a lot. So much, I won't let her say it. But I just wanna mention that she's gonna talk about a very important subject that's very important to me, which is the police state. America was meant to be a free country where the government is afraid of the people. The public servants, the remain our servants, they're afraid of the people because we are their masters. Police state is where the people are afraid of the government. And the government is a big brother watching you, trying to control you, versus us controlling the government, our public servants out there. So this lady has done a great amount of research and documentation how they're, they're, that's, that's unfortunately in the process of happening in America. So we can now we can stop it because we know what's going on. How they're trying to fuse the local city and sheriffs and state with the federal homeland security, FBI, so forth, you know, to control us, have a big police state, which we got to need to stop. So please help me. Give me a warm hand and welcome to Catherine Blush from Texas. Thank you. I'm gonna be honest, I wasn't expecting California to be so cold. <laughs> it's really chilly here. I was thinking I was gonna get away from the rain and coldness and I flew right back into it. So, welcome to California, huh? Today I'm gonna to be speaking about the police state. Many people would argue that we are fast approaching a level that would be considered that I am here today to argue that we are living, breathing, existing inside a police state already. It's nothing new. It's been growing and growing, especially since September 11th of 2001. I would define the police state as the enforcers of unnatural law having to turn to physical force and fear-based manipulation to exploit and control the populace. I think we are living in that right now. Some people may argue against me, but today I will present to you my evidence, my experiences, my documentation, what I believe is proof that we are already existing in a police state and we are fast approaching a point of no return. But I am also here today to bring you hope because I believe that we can stop this. In fact, I believe we will. So to start, let me list just a couple points that I believe are evidence toward the fact that we are living in a police state. Body scanners, TSA, fusion centers, the drug war, What's happening in Iraq and Afghanistan, forced blood withdrawals on sides of highways, checkpoints, license plates, RFID tracking technology, DNA being put in databases of all newborn babies in many states across the country, warrantless wiretapping, the IRS license plate scanning technology, the fact that they can monitor our emails and listen to our phone calls, 
red light cameras. H.R. 645, piece of legislation sitting in Congress right now that would create no more than, no fewer or more than six detention centers run by FEMA on existing military bases. It would transfer the control from the DOD over to the DHS. Police brutality, we've all seen it. It's disgusting and it's disappointing. Tasers, the fact that people in handcuffs have tasers used against them in a country that is supposed to be free. Free speech zones, behavior recognition in airports, intelligence-led policing, and you want to know what the most disgusting part is? Americans are paying for their own oppression. It is happening now, and it is funded by us. The fact of the matter is they are scared of our ideas. They are not scared of our force because we are nonviolent. We are subjected to abuse and violence on a daily basis across the globe. This is not unique to these United States. It is happening across the globe and we are allowing it to happen through our silence. They are afraid of our ideas. If they were afraid of our muscle and our might, they wouldn't have to use so much against us. That's all they have against us. Their ideas are weak. Their ideas are nothing more than propaganda. And anybody who takes the time to explore and ask questions is made very well aware of that. But that's the problem. They have us always fighting some stupid traffic ticket or dealing with some other government intervention into our lives. And we don't have the time to stop and think about what is really going on. We are just trying to survive on a daily basis. Have you been to the grocery store lately? Since when does it cost $60 for a bag of groceries? This is happening fast, ladies and gentlemen. And we are the people who are responsible for the future of this planet. We are the people right here, right now, experiencing this, and we have the opportunity to change the direction that things are happening. If you don't believe me that there is a police state in this country, I am going to tell you several stories, my personal stories, things that have happened to me. Normally when I give this presentation, I give a very technical presentation. I talk about the nitty gritty of how the DHS works and how the grant application works and how they're going around the Constitution, but I'm done talking about the technical aspects. I want to get personal today because this is affecting me personally and I'm tired of it and I want this to stop and I want to be able to live somewhere where there's a little bit of freedom sometime in my life and I think we need to take responsibility for that. The first time I really experienced what I consider the police state was at the RNC of 2008. I was a little kid. I was 23. I had become a delegate to the Republican National Convention because I supported Dr. Ron Paul. Before that, I was what one would call a lefty. I volunteered for the United Nations Association of Santa Barbara County. I was a vegetarian, still am. I eat fish now. John got me eating fish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I cared about the world and I didn't know as much as I thought I did and a lot of my actions were misguided but I was introduced thankfully by a co-worker to Dr. Ron Paul. I didn't want to listen to his speeches. I thought Republican, warmonger, not going to do it, will not listen. Just blocked him out for about six months and one day he gave a presentation on foreign policy and somehow this guy got me to watch the video and I just became consumed. I started watching video after video after video after video, thinking, you know, how is this possible? This guy, he's, he's a Republican, he's um, a Republican. How is he talking about not being in these wars that are happening right now? And it really started to shake my mind up. All of a sudden, this left-right paradigm didn't seem so real anymore. I didn't really understand what was going on. And I became incredibly active in the Ron Paul campaign. I faced a lot of adversity, that's for sure. Some of it was from Ron Paul people. There, you know, there's a lot of, I'm learning a lot of drama and a lot of activist groups, and that was kind of overwhelming, uh, as well as being, you know, basically attacked by the Republican uh, establishment at every level that we went. But when I got to the RNC, I was, uh, 
I was kind of just brought to a, a spot where I didn't really know what to do because I was a little overwhelmed. Um, there had been a lot of pressure put on us by the Ron Paul campaign not to act up at the convention. And I went as far as taking my peace sign ring off my finger and hiding it because I felt uh, like people would judge me at the RNC and I was trying to fit in, I was trying to do the Republican thing. And there were police everywhere. I'd never seen anything like it. Our buses, well, we went to go into the convention center, went through like three checkpoints and they would walk around with dogs and sometimes the dogs would come on the bus. And I really didn't understand what was going on. I mean, there were snipers on buildings. It was martial law, literal martial law. And then you have to walk through all of these layers of fencing to get in. And when you get inside, they're dictating the convention. Secret Service is up and down the aisle. They gave us chant cards, what to chant when Sarah Palin was up and how long to sit and how long to stand. And it was really overwhelming. But you know what? There was somebody there who's here this weekend. I don't know if he's in the crowd right now or not. But he showed me that day what it meant to stop trying to fit in and to start shouting the truth. And that was Adam Kokesh. He did a banner drop in the middle of the RNC. And there I was sitting on the floor terrified and miserable and feeling like I had nobody to talk to. And then there he was <laughs> doing a banner drop in the middle of the RNC and getting dragged out. And you know what? That was one of the most inspiring things I had ever seen, and I think it still affects me to this day. The next time I really experienced the police state was one day, two years ago, just about now, a couple weeks from now, it'll be two years, I got a phone call, somebody telling me that our law enforcement department in Missouri had issued a report saying that Ron Paul supporters, Chuck Baldwin supporters, libertarians, conservatives, people upset with the IRS, people upset with the Federal Reserve, people upset with RFID tracking technology, the NAFTA superhighway, that all of these people should be considered potential, radical, violent militia members and law enforcement should be just, you know, aware in case they approach someone with a Ron Paul bumper sticker on the back of their car they might be dealing with someone violent. I didn't believe it. Absolutely not did I believe it. So I called the highway patrol. This is when I lived in Missouri. Sure enough, they verified it was true. And something changed in me that day. My Adam Kokesh came out, I guess, if you will. <laughs> I became incredibly active and I was like, I was describing it yesterday to some friends, I was like a cat backed into the corner, you know, and they're like, wah, wah, wah. and I just went after the state of Missouri with video cameras and open records requests and people bombarding them. Gary Franchi with Restore the Republic sent out our action alert to 50,000 people and the nation came together and they descended upon Missouri and you know what? That report was retracted. And in the process, we were able to deliver a copy of America Freedom to Fascism, which was listed as propaganda or paraphernalia that let law enforcement know they're dealing with you know, a potential radical. We put a copy of America Freedom to Fascism in the hands of every single state rep in the state of Missouri, every single state senator, the governor and the lieutenant governor, and we did it with a copy of the Mayak Report, a copy of all the press coverage it received and our personal response to it. And you know what? Those state reps, they acted fast. So the governor defended it at first, right? He gets out on the press, so this is a good document, this is a good document. Defending it, defending this. Not happy about that, so we show up to his office. Total of five times I've showed up to Governor of Missouri's office requesting a meeting with him. This is after submitting open records requests that we just got fulfilled about three months ago, ones that we filed over a year and a half ago. This man had me thrown out of his office by armed state highway patrolmen because I was there asking to meet with him about the MIAC report. Is that not the most ridiculous thing you've ever heard? Talk about a police state. I can't even meet with my elected official about a document that said law enforcement should be afraid of me. I can't meet with them and then he sicks law enforcement on me. The irony. I brought in these wonderful women from the 912 and Tea Party movements in Missouri because keep in mind, they were profiled as well. And I was the youngest person there, it was all women. 
And we walked in, there were about six of us. And this was uh, the last time we went to the governor's office. Only two of us were not full grade, just to give you an idea of the age disparity. And these women amazed me. We walked into the governor's office and they started telling the governor that they know, or the governor's aide, that they know about Agenda 21 and they know about the CFR and they know what he's doing and they understand what's going on and they think it's ridiculous that we can't sit down and meet with them. And would you believe that these sweet little ladies in there who knew a lot more than I thought they did also had armed guards brought out to intimidate them? And would you know that these women didn't back down? They stood there, and they stood strong, and they said their piece, and they waited until they were done talking to the aide before they turned and walked out. And sure, we all walked into the bathroom, and some women cried, and it was really scary for them, but they stood strong. And that gave me hope, because I was leaving on the road for a project called Operation Defuse, which I'll tell you about here in a second, but that gave me hope that there were people who got involved for a different reason than I. I was for Ron Paul, and then the fusion center activism, and these women got involved later for different reasons, and they were standing there by my side. And that felt really good, and it gave me a lot of hope. Now, while I was gaining hope and confidence in our ability to influence things through the Missouri legislature, they held hearings on the MIAC report, I then experienced something that changed my life in a very, at first negative, but I think I've turned it into a positive way. I was standing outside of a courthouse in Maplewood, Missouri, and it was cold, and I was with a friend who was there for traffic court, and we waited in line about 45 minutes, and there were probably 30, 35, 40 people in line outside, and it was dark, and we all started mingling on the patio and talking, and an officer came out and started asking people to line up against the wall. And I turned to the girl I was talking to. I didn't know her name at the time. I now know it's Kimberly. And I said the words, get in line, show us your papers, give us your money, welcome to the new America. And this officer heard me. And he looks over the crowd and he, what did you say? And I repeated myself. Uh, I said, get in line. I think I talked to him like this because it was kind of far away. Get in line, show us your paper, give us your money, welcome to the new America. And he walks up to me and he says, do you want to go to jail tonight? Do you want to go to jail? And he's puffing his chest out at me. And I'm like, for what, sir? You know, the First Amendment gives me every right to be doing this right here. And I wasn't trying to do anything. I was just talking, you know, to the girl next to me. And he asked people, does anybody have a leash they can put on her? Yeah, and Kimberly, she jumps to, you know, she says, are you calling her a B? <laughs> and people were really confused about what was going on. And he turns to this girl, Kimberly, and he says, I know who you're here with. I'll be back in a minute. And he comes outside, and just by the grace of God, I had, in the car, grabbed a piece of paper and a pen and put it in my sweatshirt pocket. I don't know why, I really don't, just some <laughs> divine intervention, I guess. I, so I have this pen and paper in my pocket, and this officer walks outside, and he says, you have two minutes to leave, I'm going to arrest you, and walks off. And I asked the crowd, what do you guys think? And half the crowd was like, oh, go, <laughs> I would not hang around, and the other half was like, you weren't doing anything, stay, stand for... So I pulled out a piece of paper and I said, I was just told by an officer I'd two minutes to leave or I'd be arrested. I handed it to my friend and I said, if I really go to jail, will you please get witnesses to sign this? Would you believe that about two minutes on the dot, next thing I know, three officers are surrounding me, lifting me up by one arm, spinning me around, slamming me into the fence, and pointing a taser at Kimberly? Yeah. For saying, get in line, show us your papers, give us your money, welcome to the new America? That's a police state. I'm sorry. So the whole time, what do I do? I'm in shock. I have no idea what's going on. It was supposed to be a day off politics. I had no cell phone on me, no camera, which by the way, carry a camera everywhere you go because this is happening all the time. It's your only protection and I did not have it on me. Thankfully, I was able to open records, the surveillance camera videotape of it and I got 10 witness signatures. But the whole time I was processed, I talked about oathkeepers.org, oathkeepers.org, the first amendment, you're oppressing me, da 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 da. A lot of them laughed at me. So they weren't necessarily nice to me. I was told if I didn't take my nose ring out, they were gonna pin me, they were gonna get medical to come down, pin me down and cut it out. Which, for what, speaking? You're gonna cut something out of my face for speaking? This isn't a free country. And I really kind of fell apart right then. I stayed strong before and after that, but it was kind of scary being told that, you know? That's not freedom to me. I was in jail for speaking. 
I was in jail for speaking, and they told me, you must have broke some law. You must have broke some law. So I called my mom from my jail cell, because they had a pay phone in there. And I gave her my Twitter and my Facebook login. So my mom starts live tweeting and Facebooking for me from jail, letting people know what's going on, right? <laughs> So I called my mom, my mom bought a bunch of minutes on the phone, my mom's literally the hero of this story. She buys a bunch of collect call minutes and I'm calling her about every 40 minutes and she's telling me what the police station is telling people who are calling, bombarding this police station with phone calls from all across the country saying, what have you done? At one point they even told everybody I was out of jail. So I started singing, Mabel Wood says I'm free, I'm not, I'm not. And I was just driving these people crazy, I mean, the entire time. And there, I was the only white girl in there. It was all these black girls, and this black girl, she comes up to me and she says, hey, come here. She sits me down and she says, you mean white people are oppressed too? <laughs> yeah. And so we had this really great conversation. There were girls coming in and out, and we talked all about their experiences. Would you believe some of these girls get arrested walking home from work at night if they don't have an ID on them? Some of them go to jail for days and because no one in their family has a landline, they have cell phones, they can't call home and they don't know where their children are. Some of them, because in the state of Missouri you have to pay property tax on your vehicle, which I haven't done in a couple of years, and neither have some of those girls. And what happens when you don't pay your property tax and you get a ticket and you can't pay the tax and you can't pay the ticket, then you can't register your tax and you end up in jail. It's ridiculous. And there were so many of these girls who were in there for identification or vehicle issues. And did you know that this jail, Richmond Heights, which serves five communities, makes $300 a night that people stay there? Oh. Yeah. And did you know they kept telling me, you're not going home tonight, you're not going home tonight. And I said, then charge me with something, I am going home tonight. And you know what? I went home that night. They didn't make their $300 on me. Yeah. But it took a nation of activists in the middle of the night bombarding this local police department with the truth. And it took a lot of energy and a lot of time and I am so grateful that we have a network like that. We have it. We have to make sure that we're utilizing it. And that means that you need to make sure you're connected with everybody. Because if you're not, you can't reach out and you can't let people know. Is everybody in here on Facebook or Twitter? Yep. Yes, yes. Good. If you're not, I'll help set you up. It is so important, really. And make sure that somebody you know and love has your ability, your password, so that when you go to jail, because you probably will, because almost everything we do is committing a crime at some point in some state, in some city, at some time of day, you know? It's true. Thankfully, they dropped charges, they dropped them, and they wrote me an apology letter. Yeah. I'm still looking for an attorney to take on a civil case. If you know anyone in Missouri, I'm willing to do it, but it's hard doing it from a couple states away. The next time was in New Orleans. A whole crew of us from the Operation Defuse group, which is a fusion center activism group, we went down to New Orleans for the National Fusion Center Conference. Last year, last February, about a year ago, actually. And at this conference was the director of every single fusion center across the country. And the long and short, if you don't know what a fusion center is, I'm sure you all, I just described the MIAC report that was issued by a fusion center. The Missouri Information Analysis Center is one of four fusion centers in Missouri. And what they do is they merge the intelligence gathering practices excuse me, the information gathering practices, so bits of information, and their intelligence sharing practices. So with the things they create with that information, they share amongst each other, and they work together to collect bits of data. So anything from you know, a fingerprint is information, an eye color is information, your address is information, uh, your political belief is information, how much money is in your bank account is information, the profile they create from that information is then intelligence. So they share 
um, their information gathering technologies and sharing um, with each other using a lot of technology. And this is shared between as low as your campus police department, your city police department, county, uh, state PD, your FBI, CIA, foreign governments, private corporations, you name it. This is just a huge spider web system of information sharing. And these fusion centers are popping up all over the country. They are funded by the Department of Homeland Security. They came out of a piece of le legislation called the 9-11 Implementation Act of 2007. And this was the legislation that basically brought the 9-11 Commission report in, and it gave the recommendations legislative backing. And out of that, we received fusion centers. So these institutions are designed to share information, to create intelligence, and to disseminate it out. So when the Missouri Information Analysis Center created their report on the modern militia movement, they then sent that to fusion centers all across the country, which while we visited fusion centers, John and I driving around the country as well as some other activists, uh, we asked them if they received the Mayak report and many of them indeed confirmed that. So we were in Washington, or excuse me, in New Orleans, and this big conference was going on. It was a National Fusion Center conference. It happens every year. This year it's in March, and it's in Denver, Colorado, and I would encourage as many people to get there as they can. John and I got in as members of the Austin Free Press. We had press passes that we had made the night before, and we had written stories for the Austin Free Press in Austin. And so we were able to get into the conference, not without them, yes, the DHS, National Fusion Center Conference, did call hotel security on us and <laughs> did have us escorted by hotel security off to wait while they did their background checks on us, which I found awfully funny. DHS had to call hotel security. <laughs> Couldn't do it themselves, great defenders. So. We got into this conference and we were the only media folks who went to events and walked through the vendor area outside of the big press conference time. And we were assigned media liaisons. It was two ladies who worked for the FBI. One was assigned to John and one was assigned to myself and they walked with us all over this conference. And the part that I found so funny is you could tell by their reaction, they'd never had to deal with a patriot before, you know? <laughs> and so they were really confused and didn't really, I'm sure they got a lot of training, but they just never, we don't really like show up to their events, you know? And which I would like to encourage all of you to start doing because of what a success we had. So they, she was a little overwhelmed, I think, at least by some things I told her and said to her, and I just spoke to her very matter-of-factly. I told her what I was researching, why I was there, what I thought of her position, what I thought of what was going on, and she had kind of a little face twitch that would get going when I told a little too much truth, and <laughs> maybe it was because I made her uncomfortable. But that night, Two nights afterward, we'd gone through this conference. I mean, it was exhausting. One of the things I learned is uh, this year, the NCIC database, the FBI database, starts tracking facial recognition technology. So that's here this year. Next year, it's iris scanning, eyeball scanning. In the year after that, it's a scar and tattoo database. Last year, they implemented the palm print database. So if any of you have been arrested recently, which I was last year, palm prints got scanned electronically and sent to the FBI. So this is the kind of stuff that they're talking about at these events and they just say it openly and honestly and matter-of-factly and don't really see any problem with it. So when you show up and you get into these events, you can really learn a lot. We also were able to walk out with a stack of documents about this big and some of them we have not released yet, but they are juicy. And <laughs> I'll tell you this much, if the National Fusion Center Conference is designed to, uh, you know, help fusion centers with their information gathering and intelligence sharing, I'm a little concerned about the safety of their information and data because, quite frankly, we walked out with a lot of stuff that is unbelievable to me that they just had sitting out while our escorts followed us around, we were picking up and they didn't say a word. So, you know, there you go. Show up to these events. The information is there, right there. You can talk to the vendors, you can talk to the license plate scanning uh, vendors, you can talk to the, you can 
demo a retinal scanner if you'd like, no thanks, but if you want to, you can do that. They have the big military blimps there on demo and they're selling this to your Fusion Center staff. It's kind of gross, isn't it? And when you go around and you talk to them, where's all this technology being used right now? In Iraq and Afghanistan, where they're using it on brown people who are not protected by the Constitution, and now they want to take it here and use it on you. Bad news bears. <laughs> We're allowing it to happen, though, and this is because we are allowing our cities and our states to apply for grant money from the Department of Homeland Security to accept the funding and the training and the technology. That is where our problem is, ladies and gentlemen. The federal government has literally infiltrated every law, level of law enforcement, every level of elected politics are influenced in some way, sometimes detrimentally to our freedom by the Department of Homeland Security and we have to be showing up to those meetings and we have to be holding people accountable and we have to get them to say no ASAP. Do not renew these grants. Do not bring this technology into my town because if we're not stopping it in our own backyard, we sure as heck aren't going to be able to stop it happening all across the globe. So ladies and gentlemen, please get involved locally because you do have the opportunity to stop this. It's happening in your city council and it's happening through your state legislature. Now after we went through this event, of course it was extremely overwhelming. We were driving to a poetry jam. We had a caravan of activists and we wanted to go have fun because we were exhausted. It was just a completely exhausting uh, opportunity, you know, to go and be with all of these FBI agents and DHS agents. I mean, you can imagine how much energy they just suck out of you. We wanted to go have some fun, right? So we were driving to a poetry jam and sure enough, we have a headlight out, we get pulled over and the officer tries to ID everybody in the car. Now, John was driving and so of course he, had to, he showed his ID. And they come around to the back seat and they ask me for mine and I say, no, I'm in the back seat, right? Why do you need my ID? And the officer was a little confused and tried telling me then, well, if you know, I'm not gonna show me ID, then I need to get out of the car. And I'm saying, sir, I'm really not comfortable with that. <laughs> Sorry, but you know, we're in New Orleans, you're a cop, I'm not doing that. <laughs> you know, it's not gonna happen. So, um, you know, uh, I don't know what you want us to do. So next thing we know, three more officers pull up behind the vehicle, because then they try to um, card Ben, who's in the front seat, he just says no as well. I don't know why you need to see my ID. So he calls back up and so do we. We pull out three video cameras inside of our car and someone in the caravan jumps out with a video camera out back. Two of those cameras were live streaming and one was looking up law for me via quick while he was talking to counter him, right? So they're coming and they're looking in our car with their flashlights, you know, they're trying to catch us on something. They're trying to look for some reason to, you know, drag us out of the vehicle because we simply won't show our IDs. God forbid. In New Orleans, we don't show our ID when we're just passengers in a vehicle at a simple traffic stop, right? Well, the long and the short of it is this. They tried, they sent multiple officers, they tried to be tough and scary, and in the end, they walked away having given John a ticket for a headlight being out while John read him the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution. <laughs> feel really good, you know, being able to stand up and say no and to, to get away with it. I hate to say it, but that's what it felt like, you know, to not come out of it going to jail or being physically accosted in some way. Now, the next time I experienced a police state was when we went on the Operation Defuse Tour through Washington, D.C. There were officers on every corner. Their, their cars were on the corners with lights going and they were standing out on the corners. It was everywhere you turned law enforcement. We went into a museum, and on our way out, I had a pair of sunglasses on my head, and I looked down into my bag because the woman wanted to see my laptop. I had a little netbook in my bag, and my glasses fell off my head, and when I go to pick them up, she grabs me by my arm and yanks me up like I'm doing something ridiculous. And, you know, that upset me a little bit, and I added that to my tally of police state interactions because, you know what? 
that wouldn't happen in a free country. There would not be a cop standing there grabbing my arm and acting like I'm breaking a law for picking up my sunglasses. Sorry, lady, give me a second to pick up my stuff so it doesn't get trampled. Then after going through DC and seeing this disgusting police state, we're up in New Hampshire and there was an event called Liberty Forum. I don't know if any of you have heard of that. It's put on by the Free State Project. They're not putting it on this year. But it's a big conference similar to this. And they've been doing these things called 420 protests out there. And they go and they smoke pot openly. It started in Keene, New Hampshire, and people would be arrested, and people would be arrested, and they kept doing it, and they kept doing it, and finally, in Keene, New Hampshire, they quit enforcing the marijuana laws. <laughs> So then this started spreading out to other cities, right? And it started happening, and they still do them today. This event was held in Nashua, New Hampshire. They'd never held a 420 rally there before, and I thought, oh, I gotta be there, right? So I go with my video camera, and I show up at this event. There's probably, I don't know, 80 people there standing around peacefully, happily, uh, just being goofy and passing joints around and just having a peaceful, happy time. And as the event was rounding up, I was actually bored. I was laying down on a bench and just waiting for the, you know, event to get over, if you will, so we could go home and it started to disperse a little bit. I feel a shift of energy behind me and I couldn't see what happened because there was a statue there, but I felt inclined to turn on my camera and just beeline it, so I did. And I walked up on a young African-American little boy who had walked up to the event previously in the day and who I had reached out to and said, hey, there's locals here, come meet everybody. You know, you guys might want to see about coordinating multi-city protests, you know. And I had introduced him to all the folks there and they had talked about, you know, doing some activism. It was pretty cool. It was just some local people who were inspired by what was going on and wanted to get involved in the future. And I see this little boy being arrested by an undercover police officer. This really upset me because they didn't arrest any of the white people who were there and had been there for hours. They came after one of three little black kids and snagged him, snatched him in front of all these white people. And I was not gonna let that child think that we were just gonna stand there and allow this to happen because it was not good. Now, I got upset, I got emotional, but I didn't break any laws, okay? I followed the officer with my video camera and I said, you know, your children will smoke pot someday. Why are you putting him in jail? You've probably smoked pot. And the activists were chanting and a lot of them were open carrying because we were in New Hampshire, but they were peaceful and they were chanting and they lined up on the sidewalk. Some of them were out in the street. And after they put the boy in the car, a gentleman sat, stood in the road and refused to move so the police car couldn't pull out. I didn't know what was going on. I had never seen civil disobedience before like this, so I really had no idea what was going on. I just was trying to document it. So they tried to pull out. They can't go anywhere. They get out of the vehicle, and I see David collapse in front of the police car. I still didn't know what was going on. And I walk up with my video camera, you know, whoa, 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 what are you doing to this guy? What are you doing to this guy? And David's holding his hands like this and he's refusing to let go. And they're trying to arrest him, they're trying to arrest him, they can't, they can't, they can't. So they take him and they drag him to the back of the police vehicle. I follow. So do several other activists, there's probably 12 people and they're all just saying, let go of him, let go of him, he's nonviolent, don't hurt him, let go, what are you doing? Sure enough. This officer pulls out mace. He has somebody limp laying on the ground doing nothing. And this officer pulls out mace. Now I couldn't handle it. And at the top of my lungs, I just yelled, do not mace him. And you can hear it in every videotape on the entire thing. And the guy thought twice. But as soon as that interaction finished, I heard a dog barking behind me. And I didn't realize that in my pure state of adrenaline, watching this person who had just asked me to videotape the pain he was feeling in his wrists, about to get maced, that about, I don't know, 10 backup cars had shown up and all of the other activists had gone back to the other side of the police car on the sidewalk and I was standing there alone. And 
I turn around and there's a German shepherd barking in my mouth, in my face, and all I see is an officer standing with his legs straddled over a dog on its hind legs barking at me. And the first thing out of my mouth, thank God for this, was I am here to document this, do not stick that dog on me. And he says, arrest her. And the words out of my mouth while they're handcuffing me are, I am afraid of that dog. I went to jail again. For speaking, for videotaping, for not wanting to witness violence enacted upon a peaceful person. Now this time I didn't handle it as well. I wasn't oathkeepers.org, oathkeepers.org. I was crying because I was so upset. And the officer who was driving me in my police car, I asked him to look me in the eyes because I kept asking, why are you doing this? What law have I broke? What are you doing? What, are you, what, what is going on? I'm in New Hampshire, right? I live in Texas. <laughs> it's a little ridiculous. And he looks in the mirror and he has tears in his eyes. And I could tell that he didn't like what he was doing. He had been called there on backup. He didn't know what was going on. And I'm sitting here sobbing, saying I didn't do anything. And he's working as directive. And I went into this jail. And they really, really, really wanted me to give my fingerprints. And I said, if you show me a state law, because in Missouri they didn't print me, if you show me a state law that I have to in, in your state, I'll respect those laws, um, but I'm not going to until then. And unfortunately, in the end, they did come and show me what at the time read like a law, but it says that they, they may take prints, and I just kind of took it as, that, okay, fine, I'll give them to get out, and I regret that. I do, I wish I had sat there without giving my prints, and I think in the future that's what I would do because now the FBI has my entire palm prints. But while I was in there, about 50 activists showed up and stood in the lobby there to support myself and the little black boy and the others who were arrested, David. And would you believe that they stood on the steps and smoked marijuana of the jail? <laughs> Now that night was rough. I really, 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 I didn't enjoy that at all. And it's not what I set out to do. It's not, it's not something I wanted to go through. And it hurt me a lot. It made me uh, just realize how bad things are. And it affected me pretty heavily over the summer, last summer. It, it really, my heart was broken, you know, that this could happen. I had to fly out to New Hampshire twice. The first time they rescheduled my trial after I arrived, and the second time they found me not guilty. Of what was your charge? Uh, disorderly conduct and resisting arrest, which it took them six seconds to have me arrested from dog to could of car. So, you know, I did not resist in any way, shape, or form. Now, later that summer, this document was published, the intelligence report by the Southern Poverty Law Center. And this edition was called the Meet the Patriots edition. And it went out to fusion centers and law enforcement all across the country. And in this magazine, they talk about all of these violent, racist, hateful people, okay? The, some of them do engage in acts of violence. Some of them may be wrongly accused as racist. I don't know. I haven't done the research on everybody in here, but in the middle of all those articles, they list 30 people that they call the leaders of the Patriot Movement. They're not calling them racist. They're not calling them dangerous. They're just letting everybody know that these leaders happen to be in some way or another, at least in this magazine, associated with all these other articles because it's published in the same document. And somehow my face is right in the center. <laughs> and I don't understand why me, I'm now 26, about to turn 27, was somehow put cheek to cheek with all of these amazing people who are listed in this document. But that 
was kind of an overwhelming thing as well. <laughs> you know, to think, okay, law enforcement across the country now has seen my face associated with all of these things that the SPLC typically focuses on. And that too made me realize just how dangerous things are becoming. And that summer, I was asked to interview with Jesse Ventura for his conspiracy theory television series. And so I agreed to do that. And in July, they flew me out to Minnesota to do the interview. Now, I just wanted to get there and get home. So I had four flights in one day, which, I mean, I don't know if any of you have ever done that before, but it's not fun. And I just was not in the mood for trouble. I was not in the mood to do anything, you know, cause any ruckus with TSA. But sure enough, I go walk through the terminal and there's a body scanner. <laughs> oh God. And I take a couple steps forward. I realize what it is. I take a couple steps back and I said, no thanks. <laughs> I don't think so. I'll take the wand. Because at the time, I thought that that was what the repercussions were if you said no. You got wanded down and then you got to go onto the plane. Well, this was right after they had switched to the enhanced pat downs, which I was not aware of. And they say, no ma'am, we're gonna have to do a full body search. And I'm like, what? No, no, not gonna happen, no. <laughs> Sorry, I will not participate. Uh, there must be something else that can be done. So all these TSA agents start coming over and they're talking and they're talking and they don't know what to do, they don't know what to do. There are like 12 of them and I'm standing there and I'm like, okay, you know, I gotta get on this plane, like, come on. And they say they called their supervisor. And I said, well, I'm not going through a full body search, so, you know, like, let's, let's hurry up whatever we need to do, but there's gotta be another option. And they say, no, your option is not to fly. And they pick up all my stuff and they walk me out to the terminal and they dump all my belongings on the ground, picking my earrings up from the floor and my rings and I'm, and it, here's another mistake I made, lesson you all can learn from me. Instead of turning on my camera on my phone, I called the producer for the Jesse Ventura show, thinking he could help me somehow. Well, then I didn't document what happened after this. So. I have him on the phone, I'm picking all my stuff up from the floor, I see the TSA supervisor come walking through, and I'm thinking, great, this is the guy I can talk into letting me onto the plane, right? And as soon as he figures out that I'm the problem he just got called over about, he went into insta-jerk mode. And he starts telling me that the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution gives him the right and the duty to search me before I get on the plane. What? Uh, yeah. So I have the producer for the Jesse Ventura show on the phone. I'm going, did you just hear this? Yes, I did. What do we do? I don't know. And so we're standing here talking. We're going back and forth. We're going back and forth. <laughs> so finally, I agree with this guy um, that, you know, I don't remember what I agreed, actually. I just turned and walked back through the line is what I ended up doing. And I turned to the right instead of the left, and there was a... Um, a uh, metal detector there instead of a body scanner. And I'm like, yes, I go walking through, kind of celebratory, I'm going through the non-body scanner, right? Man, we're gonna need you to step over here. And they pull me over to the side. And they told me that this is what I agreed to. I said, I will let you do a pat down, but you're not touching my lady bits. And so that's what we had agreed to. So I go walking through, but the whole time I'm going through, I'm being heckled by this guy. He comes in, he stands on the edge, I'm in the little glass cage, you know, and he's standing there and he's laughing and I'm like, you think this is funny? That's disgusting, you pig. And this poor woman, she's an older woman, she says, baby, I'm gonna touch you with the back of my hands. I don't wanna do this either. And this man stood there and laughed while one woman molested another, both of them against their will. And ladies and gentlemen, that is what taxpayer dollars is funding. Thanks for who, all those who said not mine either. <laughs> now, I allowed my desire to be on the Jesse Ventura show to convince me not to say no. And I think I should have said no. And I think in the future, I would rather risk infuriating a television producer and losing my opportunity to do an interview like that and subject myself to something that is so against my personal morals and my personal beliefs. And it made me realize how easy it is for people to just deal with something because they're trying to get somewhere or they're trying to do something. 
or whatever they see on the other side is so important that they just got to deal with it, even if they don't believe in it and even if they're not okay with it. Shortly after that incident, I had stayed in Missouri for a month over the summer and I had just got back down to Central Texas. Literally, first morning, I get a phone call. Catherine, this isn't a good phone call. John's in jail. Come to find out, John, as well as three other activists, had shown up to an Obama speech on the UT campus down in Austin, Texas. And when they were asked, now keep in mind, they were there talking about the war. John had a press pass on him and was interviewing and documenting the event. These were people who were upset with Obama's policies, not the ones who were in support of his policies, were asked to move to the free speech zone. And one at a time, as each of them said no, all four ended up in jail. All of them said they were doing what the Secret Service told them to do. Now, this is a campus where activism takes place all the time. And people hand out literature all the time. And free speech is utilized all the time. So what makes it different when Secret Service is there? That's what I would like to know. What makes it different when Secret Service is there? Is it it makes Obama's stomach so sick to see that there are people who don't like the fact we're murdering people all over the globe? I wouldn't want to look at the people protesting me either if I were him. Well, nobody there had experienced a arrest like this in Austin, really. I mean, there hadn't been any major incidents, whereas in New Hampshire, this happens all the time. They do it on purpose. They do civil disobedience. And so a lot of people turned to me to figure out what to do, and I kind of became the rallying point. And I had every single person in every step of the process of their arrests being processed from the campus to the jail on the phone. I knew where every piece of paper was. I knew every step of the way. And every time they told me that they wouldn't be out till morning, I said, screw you, they will just you watch. And I stood there for I don't know how many hours, but it was long. And I didn't leave the jail. People kept showing up and showing up and the crowd kept growing and the crowd kept growing. And we lit candles and we marched around the jail chanting, free John, free Chanda, free speech. And the local media came out and they interviewed us and they documented what was happening. And we put on so much pressure that you know what, once again, that jail didn't get paid for those four overnight stays. <laughs> The most recent experience that I have with the police state is involving the Jesse Ventura show again. Now, this episode aired once and then twice a second time that night, and it was supposed to re-air the following weekend. Now, the episode didn't re-air, and nobody could figure out why. Lo and behold, the congressman who was confronted by Jesse Ventura put direct pressure on the True TV network to scrub the episode, and they did. If these stories don't prove to you that we do live in a police state, then I don't know what can. And I'm going to move forward without you because it is time that we change our tactics. We have to learn how to live free and how to survive as sovereign individuals so that we can stop funding this institution and propping it up and allowing it to dictate the way we live our lives. But that's up to us. And that's up to changes that we have to make. Many of you are already starting to grow food or to can food or to buy um, food reserves that you already have you know, prepackaged and, and ready to go for the future. Do more of that. Teach your neighbors. But most of all, we've got to be waking up the youth. They are our future. And we have allowed generation after generation to be indoctrinated by this machine and they are sucking out our souls. It is time that we change the way we live our lives. 
And I would encourage all of you to reconsider your involvement with the state in any way, shape, or form, whether it's through political activism, unless you think your message is so educational that it will reach people and bring them to a level beyond politics. But if not, I would encourage you to get out and start relating on a human level because this is a human spiritual crisis. And we are at a point now where we are nearing no return. If they can institute this technological dictatorship, we may not be able to get out of this without a lot of blood and a lot of pain and a lot of fear and our future generations growing up watching even more violence than we. It is up to us right now. We have to change the way we live our lives. We are destroying this planet. We are destroying each other. We are destroying what makes us human. We are very powerful. We are infinitely powerful, each of us, and that's what they're sucking out of us. They want us to think that we can't exist without them, that they are our bread and butter and our life force, but you know what, they're not. They're nothing. They're nothing. They are worthless, they are pointless, and they are irrelevant if we make them. But we have to stop giving them our energy. We have to stop showing up and begging them to stop what they are doing, and we must stop them ourselves. Stop asking, start demanding. I've made a commitment to change my life. I'm changing the direction that I'm heading. I'm changing the things that I am doing. I've proven to myself that politics don't work. I've proven to myself that the state is corrupt. I don't need any more evidence. I'm done. I am done. I want to rise above this. I want to leave this behind us. As I said earlier, I want to live at least a day in my life knowing what freedom is. Yes. I was born in 1984. Figuratively and literally. <laughs> and I'm ready to move on. So I hope that all of you are willing to stand shoulder to shoulder with me and that we can all march forward as free people, as sovereigns, and we can stop asking for permission because I, for one, am done. Thank you guys.